Good afternoon, members. Let me take this opportunity to welcome you to today's webinar. It is 12 noon. And uh, today's webinar, we have a presentation So today's, today's uh, lead presenter is Professor Kenneth Ngure. And uh, Professor Ngure holds an MPH, MSc and a PhD in, uh, and is a behavioral scientist and associate professor of global health and the chair of department of community health of Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology, Jaipur. He has been conducting HIV prevention research for close to 20 years, collaborating with local and international scientists, and has over 120 peer-reviewed manuscripts with over 6,000 citations on Google Scholar, and he holds several research grants. Members, uh, it's also important to note that Professor Ngure uh, was recognized as the uh, most prolific author from JQuat, the lead author from JQuat for the last five years. And we are very happy to have this giant with us and uh, this expert in the area of HIV and AIDS. So without taking so much time, I would like to welcome Professor Gure to give us his presentation. And like I had said, this is being streamed live on YouTube. Uh, so you could share the uh, I mean, on, on Discover JQuat YouTube, I'll, I'll put the link uh, on the chat so you could share with your friends who are probably not able to log in. Uh, but also as the presentation goes on, kindly feel free to post your questions or your comments on the chat section, and then we'll be able to pick them and rest, and the Professor Ngure will respond. So now over to Professor Ngure, Karibu Sana, and uh, take it up from here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kinyuru. It's a real pleasure to share this uh, presentation. And um, I thank uh, the directorate for offering me this opportunity to share with you uh, the work that we have been doing in collaboration with others around HIV prevention. And probably so that we maintain the quality of the audio, I'll probably put my video off and then probably put it back when we are having discussions. Uh, so the, the title of my presentation is um, HIV Developments, a key difference in HIV prevention research, and we'll be focusing on PrEP. Let's see. Okay. So the, we have a HIV problem in Kenya. And in a recent uh, survey known as Kenfia that was uh, done by NASCOP, we still have about 36,000 annual HIV infections among uh, adults. If you think about uh, that 6,000 new HIV infections, if you think in terms of bus roads, this would be so many bus roads, probably over 100,000 bus roads of people getting HIV every year. And we still have about 1.3 million people uh, living with HIV in Kenya, translating to about 4.9% prevalence. And we also have about 139,000 children living with HIV. And it's, it's important to know this because it's in terms of um, we need to think about HIV prevention. If we, we still continue getting these infections, we need to then still focus on HIV prevention. And this is an important slide. For many of us, and especially the older persons, we know that HIV prevention has mainly focused on ABCs. We talked about this for the last, I don't know, probably three or four, close to four decades. And the A was abstinence, B was being faithful, and C was condoms, and still remains the same. But the key point is that these strategies are important. But even with these strategies, we are still getting thousands of new infections each year. And that is why there is a need to develop additional interventions that can be used to help people prevent themselves from HIV when ABCs do not work or in conjunction with the ABCs. And then um, 
now we'll now delve into the pre-exposure prophylaxis, and I'll explain what this is. But the journey started from early clinical work, then we came to clinical trials, and I'll move on until we come to what is currently being done. Around 2007, 2006, probably even before I joined the university, we, and together with some researchers, had a question whether we could, there are drugs that could be used to reduce the risk of HIV acquisition by the negative people. And this was, uh, we are basing this on a similar analogy. For example, when you are going to Mombasa or other malaria endemic zones, you use the same drugs that are used to, to treat malaria for prevention. There was also early clinical studies that were done by other individuals in other places in the world that had demonstrated high efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this is where you're using ARVs to prevent HIV acquisition. And they used animal models and were shown to be quite efficacious even when the animals were challenged with high doses of HIV. And even when you think about PMTCT, when, when infants are born from uh, mothers who have HIV, they also get, they get ARVs to protect them from getting HIV. So these thoughts were not new. And um, so the, specifically the clinical trials tested the safety and efficacy of uh, AL, an ALV or ALVs known as one was tenovovil, the other one was a tenovovil based, had tenovovil and emitricitabine known as Truvada. And these studies were conducted in various parts of the world. And this is important so, that, so as to increase generalizability and among different populations. And the, the populations are just shown down here, including injector, those who inject drugs, drugs, men who have sex with men, several discordant couples, high risk women. And what was shown is that PrEP or ARVs when used for HIV prevention are very efficacious. And this, if you look on, um, on my right on the column on efficacy, you can see it was highly efficacious with some as high as 86%. You come on, do uh, there's 86, another 75% efficacy. And these 75 and 67 were because you used two drugs. One was tenovovil, the other one was um, tenovovil plus emitricitabine. And then, but you, as you come down, you'll see an efficacy of 44%. And what was learned later? is that efficacy was based on adherence. For oral prep is that you need to take the ALV pill every day. For studies that did not have efficacy, including some known as FEM prep and voice, all these studies, it was narrowed down to adherence. And then, so when people do not adhere, then the efficacy is much lower. So the, for this pill to work, it has to be taken. We and other colleagues had done correlates of low adherence. What was what was what populations had lower adherence? And one of them was being young, so younger age who had low adherence. Those who are not partnered, those who had um, perceived themselves at less risk, those who experienced stigma and other issues such as less. Those, those who are not sexually active, um, issues of alcohol use, and um, not attending to appointments. So all these were correlates of um, low adherence. So we answered that question of efficacy. A product can be very efficacious, but it cannot be used if it's not safe. And these were the first studies where we were using ARVs among HIV negative people. And in research, we assume nothing. So you, even if they're currently being used by HIV infected persons, we still wanted to demonstrate safety in HIV uninfected individuals. And what was noticed is that um, there were, there were no differences between those who are taking the active product versus those who are taking placebo in terms of rates of death, serious adverse events, these include hospitalization and issues of laboratory abnormalities. But, and PrEP was well tolerated, but in, a, in about um, less than 10% of individuals, they experienced some gastrointestinal adverse events where they could have nausea, diarrhea, uh, but and this was mainly in the first month. So again, it's balancing whether you, for those ones, whether they want to 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 persevere those minor side effects and protect themselves from HIV. There was also a small change, less than one percent, in bone mineral density, which was insignificant in terms of uh, not increasing the risk of fractures. 
The other thing is um, about risk compensation. Risk compensation is, for example, you may have a product that is being used to prevent HIV. There's always this fear in the background, which is more of a theoretical issue that people then may engage in more risky behaviors because there is something that's a product. They are taking a pill to protect them from HIV. But, and uh, we remember that if people increase their risky behaviors, although they are protected from HIV, they could get STIs. These are sexually transmitted infections. And sexually transmitted infections could also increase the risk of HIV. And several of them have been shown to do that. And that could undo the benefits of um, HIV prevention. And through the analysis of uh, both the, the two of these studies, one of is IPREX, another one known as PANAS PREP, there was no difference in terms of um, condom use uh, and other uh, aspects of HIV prevention during the time that they were using the pro products and um, when they actually knew that the products were working. So it, it, this compensation was not shown in these studies, but still it's a, a question that's being analyzed and looked into. There's this other question that has always been asked and it's been asked many times. I remember many years ago when we were doing submitting this to our IRBs, uh, ethical review committees, there was this question of resistance. What about resistance? But one thing is even when taking an ARB, resistance occurs when somebody already has a virus. So it's a virus that becomes resistant. So if you're HIV negative and you're able to take to adhere properly to to prep, then there's no risk of resistance. Resistance occurs if someone is not adhering properly and so that then you have some breakthrough infections. And then, so in, in these studies, when we looked at the number of resistance cases, for example, in one of the studies, partners PrEP, there are only two resistant cases, and these are the people who acquired HIV while taking PrEP and not adhering properly. And then there are models to have for the, the number of infections averted was, was 23. So even if you are able to get, so it's a balance. So you get a few cases of people getting resistance, probably they are not adhering properly, but you prevent many more. Remember, even uh, resistance occurs naturally for people who are on ARVs, if, even when they, have their, 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 if, when they have challenges either in adherence or over time. So, there is a benefit of preventing new infections, even as we think about this question of resistance. So, and when we think about the use of PrEP, there are risk, risks, but there are greater risks in not doing enough. So, after those trials that ended in 2011, there was major recommendations for one starting with the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Authority that approved the tenovovil based drugs as a HIV prevention tool. And this was the first time. All these years, we had all these other tools I've mentioned, but there was no time that an ALV drug had been approved for HIV prevention. After FDA, it was closely followed by the WHO. For those who are in the health sciences, know the role WHO plays in terms of um, writing guidelines that guide a lot of um, health that is being implemented in many countries because countries like ministries of health rely on WHO guidelines to develop their own local guidelines. And um, so WHO issued these guidelines and the key was that um, this can be used for people at increased risk of HIV, but called for demonstration projects within countries. So we move, now we are moving on. Now we've moved from now our clinical work, clinical trials, and now we move on to demonstration project. Remember, demonstration projects are usually smaller projects with few people in a few thousands, and they are done in countries so that you can be able to scale up. And I know for those who also have do agriculture and other fields, they usually have those small micro farms where they, they sort of demonstrate to others before they can go and scale up. So you learn from the smaller projects. And as a result of WHO calling for demonstration projects, there were many demonstration projects that were called on because in clinical trials, the environment is usually not what you would find in a, in a public health facility. It's highly regulated, uh, highly controlled, 
And when something works in a clinical trial, it does not say it's going to work as well as it did in a clinical trials in a real world setting. So there was a need for this demonstration project. And I'll highlight one of the demonstration project. One of them was a, actually, and this was done in Kenya and Uganda, and it was a, a prospective interventional study where PrEP was offered to HIV, to the HIV negative person in a serial discordant relationship for six months until the one who HIV infected achieved viral suppression. And I'll come and talk a bit later about what it means when one is virally suppressed. And as you can see, this one enrolled only about a thousand couples. And within this, based on modeling on behavioral characteristics, we would have expected to find 83 new HIV infections. But because of the use of PrEP, the only four infections were observed, demonstrating a 95% reduction in HIV risk, which is much higher than what was observed in the trials, which was 75%. This was quite encouraging because sometimes things do much better in trials, but when you come out into the real world, then you end up finding lower efficacy. And there was a manuscript that was published as a result of that. And for serial discordant relationships, people in serial discordant relationships, we use PrEP as a bridge to ALT. And, and this is all a bridge to viral suppression. So the, the person who is HIV uninfected uses AL, uses PrEP for about six months. By that time, the one who is HIV infected achieves viral suppression and they cannot transmit HIV. I also want to highlight for those who are hearing for the first time that there are many couples who are HIV serial discordant. In Kenya, it's estimated to have over 200,000 couples who are in HIV serial discordant relationship. That is one is HIV infected and the other one is HIV uninfected. One can ask why, how, I think that's a discussion for another day, but what I would want to highlight is that for any HIV transmission to occur, there's usually a partnership that is serial discordant. How long that is maintained, that, that is something then again for discussion because it can be from a short while, it could even go to months or even years when people are serial discordant. But we also know that there are factors that increase the risk of HIV acquisition or transmission, such as people having as sexually transmitted infections and such. And even in the demonstration projects, we were able to observe that there was no increase or no evidence of risk compensation. Now let's switch gears and talk about pregnancy and postpartum. Um, there's, it's, there's, it's very important to focus on pregnant and postpartum women because we have been able to see through observational studies that HIV risk is similar to other risky groups. For example, on this bar chart, as you can see, pregnant and postpartum women in one study had an incidence of 3.8%. When you compare to female sex workers who are 5%, and this was even higher than those who are in HIV serial discordant relationships. The reasons why pregnant and postpartum women are at higher risk, some of them include hormonal or physiological reasons, but there are also behavioral reasons. We have been able to document that um, in people, when people are when women are pregnant, there are other factors that come into play. Whether they are part, the male, some of the male partners get additional partners, and when they get additional partners, then they are, they, then there is an increase in HIV transmission. And then um, also sometimes their their male partners are also not tested, or they are not able to bring their partners for testing. And if they are HIV infected, then there is also an increased risk of HIV transmission. And there are many papers that's, that our, we did work with the other colleagues to publish, and these were just able to show that PrEP is safe in pregnancy. What about breastfeeding? Similar concepts, similar issues, but um, when PrEP, we tested PrEP among breastfeeding women, we were able to see that um, there's very little amount that gets to to the baby during breastfeeding. If a, a HIV uninfected woman uses PrEP, and you can see that in that, that um, small, uh, that I hope you can see in red, it's a very small amount compared to the therapeutic daily dose of 30 milligrams. When, when infants um, during PMTCT or when they're HIV infected, what gets to the baby is about 30 milligrams. 
but what gets to the baby through breastfeeding from a HIV negative mother is 0 0.0235. Um, then one of the ways that oral prep could be used is during safer conception. As I said, we have over 200,000 couples who are in several disco relationships in Kenya. And um, we learned from some of our work, which is already published, is that women or couples, when they know they're even in a serial discordant relationship, they will avoid using protection so that they can conceive. Because that what drives them to conceive is sometimes stronger than the risk of HIV acquisition. And some of it is because family members are driving it or they want to get it. And so all those things, um, some of the things that drive couples who are in serial discordant relationship to take risk to conceive naturally even when they know that are, there's a risk of HIV transmission. And this informed another trial where we had about 74 couples and we used both PrEP and ALT and I followed the couples for a, a year. Through these 12 months, we were able to see, to record about 46 pregnancies with no single HIV transmission. So as we think about Oral pre-exposure prophylaxis could be a very good tool for couples who are in serial discordant relationship to reduce the risk of HIV transmission when they want to conceive naturally. You know, there are also others, the other, other ways of conception, which sometimes are too expensive, artificial insemination and others, and sometimes not too acceptable to couples. So now we have all these signs showing that PrEP is safe and is safe even for pregnant and breastfeeding women. The next step is then to scale up. And when you're thinking about scale up of intervention is that um, you want to have several questions that you need to focus on. First is that when you have a tool that works, it cannot be for the 47 million Kenyans. You have to know which populations are at higher risk of HIV acquisition. You also need to think, and that's why I've underlined it, around strategies to reduce stigma because we know in our country and in many other countries, there are populations that are stigmatized. But as I say, for many of us who have a health background, is that when you're providing a service, you do not need, you need to reduce stigma so that those populations who are highly stigmatized can be able to walk into clinics and get a service. Because it's only that protecting everybody who is at risk that you can be able to address the issue of um, the risk of HIV. Then you had, there are many other questions when you think about implementation around uptake, about adherence, about sexual behavior, whether people would change their sexual practices in the real world if they get this tool, whether it's going to be safer and for longer term use, because in these trials were being used for about two years, then we need to think about delivery and also need to think about impact. But what was reassuring is that we had seen higher adherence in demonstration projects than we had seen in clinical trials. And as I said, this is new. Usually you find it's the other way around. Usually you find higher adherence in clinical trials because there's a lot of support, people are being canceled and everything than in demonstration projects or real world. There's also the issue of cost for policymakers. Whenever you have a new intervention, policymakers want to know how much will this intervention cost? Would it be affordable? And as you're thinking about population, which population do you focus on? And that's why WHO was recommending PrEP for populations that have an incidence of higher than 3% or 3 per 100 person years. And usually with terms of costs, some of our groups have done costs and cost around $100. That's 10,000 per couple per year. Now let's come now to, now we have done all the science uh, the Ministry of Health was heavily involved and informed in terms of um, what was going on. And after all this, then the Ministry of Health then launched in 2016 revised ALT guidelines. And these guidelines also included uh, oral pre exposure prophylaxis in the guidelines. After that, there were all these steps, including formation of technical working group, prep implementers, prep implementer, implementers meeting, and all these. And this led in 2017 to a national PrEP rollout. So whatever science that we do, especially for us as faculty members, it's good to keep involving stakeholders 
so that the science has a high likelihood of being taken up. And this was launched in May 2017. There was, and when you have the ministry launching, there is always then media to support this, and this works to also educate the general public. And um, a guiding principle within then this PrEP program in Kenya is that PrEP is not a standalone, but is an additional tool that is integrated into existing services and in existing tools. So currently, the, 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 the preferred regimen is TDF FTC, which we call Truvada, but there are also additional alternative regimens like Tenovovir alone, which is TDF 300 or TDF 3TC. Uh, we know that um, PrEP, uh, the, the Kenyan HIV epidemic is concentrated in several counties, especially those in Nyanza, and um, you can see them highlighted. They are high incidence, medium incidence, and low incidence. And as you think about this, then you are able to know which counties to focus on and which populations to focus on. And for example, if you go to around Lake Victoria, there is also another population there which is at increased risk of HIV, which is the fisher folk. So from May 2017, we have the, the, the Ministry of Health has been able to put over 100,000 on pre-exposure prophylaxis. That's 113,000. And this was by data by end of uh, uh, June, sorry. Yeah. There have been a lot of media campaigns using some of these materials. Worldwide, we have over a million people who have already initiated oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And this, this, this is data from January, but currently there's close to 1.4 or 1.5. And you can see Kenya there is in dark. It's one of the countries that is doing quite well in global rollout of oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. And there, there is a benefit when um, research happens in a country like Kenya, then interventions are, it's easy to have interventions taken up. Because even when you go to your policy maker or to your population, you are saying this research happened in Kenya, happened in, in, in Kisumu, happened in Nairobi, we're able to find this. So even as we think about COVID vaccine and other studies that are coming, it's good when science is done in a, in a country because the local are the first benefit. Is when an intervention is found to work. Many projects that are supporting Ministry of Health in the implementation of PrEP, and some, these are some of them. One of them is, uh, this is the case by Jepiego. It's, uh, it's, it's putting a lot of people on PrEP, close to more than 20,000. And there's another one as a partner scale-up project, which I was so involved in, and ended up putting over 8,000 couples on oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. So now we know PrEP works. It's being rolled out in the government facilities, and probably what I did, a slide I didn't show is that over 2,000 facilities currently are rolling out oral pre exposure prophylaxis. So, in the sub county hospital, you know, or a county hospital, you know, is probably having uh, this program, which is quite good because usually there's a lag between what the science and implementation. Science may show a product is works and is safe, but takes many, many years before something is taken up, but this is currently rolling out very well. So one of the key things we that, that, that has been done by others, is, I'm not involved with this team, but I know, I know the team is um, integrating PrEP in, among postpartum women in MCH. And this PrEP, this I was able to put, uh, offered about uh, 9,000 uh, women who are postpartum pregnant and postpartum were offered PrEP and um, you are able to see that 22% of them initiated PrEP, meaning that they were at high risk of HIV because PrEP is not for everyone. It's only for those who are at increased risk of HIV. And probably if you see almost 2000 initiating, you are saying that you are preventing probably over a thousand HIV acquisition. Then PrEP has also been integrated in the family planning clinics, because again, people are going to family planning clinics. Some of them may be at increased risk, and again, 20% were able to take up PrEP. These studies were done in Western Kenya. Then 
as in, still in the same vim of simplifying delivery, research has shown about 50% of us access care in pharmacies. I'm sure many of us who are listening, if you have a home today or you have a, a, a toothache, the first place before you go to a hospital will be to your local pharmacy. So if we only concentrated in offering prep in Sorry, members, I think we lost Professor Ngure. Let's see if we can reconnect with him shortly. Prof is, Prof is joining shortly. He's actually back now. Oh, so sorry. I'm, uh, I dropped off. I think my internet uh, misbehaved. But I'm... Yeah. I'm I do yeah. really... Good to have you back, Prof. We can continue. I guess I dropped off when I was on this slide. And specifically, I was saying in the theme of simplifying delivery, 50% of us get healthcare from pharmacies. And I gave an example, if somebody had, has a cold or has a toothache, they'll go to their local pharmacy. So if we only implemented this, this intervention in a public health facility, we would be missing 50% of people. And so um, we are, there, there is a thought about delivering prepping pharmacies and probably, sorry, uh, so delivering prep, let me start with this. So there's a thought about delivering prep in pharmacies. And this is currently what is, what's, we have some research funding to pilot prep in pharmacies. Again, as you know, in um, in the health currently, if you do not empower pharmacists and come up with some guidelines, then what will happen is that these products, because there's demand, are going to be given without a proper structure. So there is a um, room to pilot this um, and with them, um, with collaborators in a few pharmacies. And then we see how this, this intervention is taken up. And we have a lot of things that uh, we have put in place because you know, there are no doctors in pharmacies, most of the pharmacies. So we have a remote doctor to be called when a pharmacist have questions and when they're dispensing oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. I want to, also talk about HIV self-testing. Uh, many of you now have heard now it's easy for one to go to a pharmacy and test themselves. And so in the theme of also simplifying delivery is that we are also recently completed a study which was funded by NIH. And this study was to use oral HIV self-test kits so that people who are on PrEP do not need to come every three months to a health facility. Because the reason that they need to come frequently is for HIV testing. So if they can test themselves, then they, 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 they may not need to come to the facility. But we do not know, we do not know whether this works. So what we did is we did a large trial where we randomized people to either every three months, that is the current standard, and to come every six months, but in between test themselves with the HIV self kit. Test, test kits, and we have not seen any difference so far, although we are now analyzing the data. So if this works out, then probably people may not always need to come to a facility so often. 
And this is in the theme of we known as differentiated uh, delivery, because when you, are, you do a service where you are client-centered, then you know different people need have different needs. There are somebody who needs to come to the clinic every month, every month. There are others who need to come to the clinic probably every six months or even longer. So you need to think about this. Even people who have busy lifestyles do not need to come to the clinic very often. And then we, uh, we also need to think as we're thinking about PrEP that um, clinical consultations should be considered differently from prescription uh, refills so that uh, people do not always need, if you do not require clinical consultation, you could come to a pharmacy and just pick your PrEP and go. And um, some of the research has shown that even when you space visits, it does not interfere with both adherence and retention. And people have changing needs over time. And this differentiated model of delivery is also being implemented for ALT. And then when you think about one of the biggest challenges with oral, uh, oral prep has been adherence. And I know all of us who have had a seven day or a five day course of antibiotics, uh, not many of us have ended up taking each of the pills uh, despite knowing the benefit of this. So adherence has been the real challenge with this. With this and then, so in one of the trials, uh, we thought that because uh, SMSs has, have been found to be to be to support adherence for ALT, we piloted we ran a trial to see whether SMSs could support adherence uh, to prep. And this we enrolled 348 young women because the biggest challenge in adherence has been around young women and they are to receive SMSs. But what we found is that um, SMSs for this did not support adherence for this population. And so there's a need to think beyond use of SMSs to support adherence for young women. Because the biggest, discordant couples we've not found a challenge, but young women who are among the highest risk groups uh, or the, the SMSs did not support adherence. And uh, so for those who need oral prep, and especially the young women, they may need additional adherence support interventions. And one of the support interventions that has, has been shown to work is giving feedback. The way you, you come to a clinic every three months and you are told whether you've been adhering. And that's why we're in one of our um, studies is that we have um, a test kit, a urine-based test kit that is testing urine to see the, whether one has detectable drug level. And we are randomizing women to either the standard where they're not getting feedback and whether they're getting feedback, whether they have any drug. And based on this intervention, and then they can be able to know whether they're adhering and want to see whether that feedback improves adherence. Now we change gears a bit and talk about vaginal rings. And this may be very new to many people, Vaginal rings have been used in other countries as a form of contraception. One of them is known as Nuva ring. And the benefit of use of vaginal ring first is that it's longer acting. So you put it every month. The, the women put it in, in their reproductive system every month and it stays there. And the other thing is ease of use. So you don't need to keep removing and inserting back like the daily adherence. And actually the kind of ring that's going to be rolled out is actually going to be three months. So you put a ring for three months and then one is protected. It's also much safer than the oral pill because it acts locally. There's very little drug that gets into the system. It acts, it acts locally. So that's a, a huge benefit as opposed to something that you take and has to be a lot of drug goes into your blood. And then privacy. So you don't, people who do not need to disclose to others that they're using, then they, they, can, they can just keep it. As opposed to if people are sharing a room or they're in a house, then it's easier for others to see that they're taking pills. So in another study known as REACH or MTN034, specifically chose these young women who have been facing challenges with adherence. And even in another, in um, some other studies, these young women, even when they were given uh, rings, they had challenges in adherence. And what they did is that they took both the ring and oral prep in a head-to-head -head comparison where they, they did this, this is known as a crossover design. So they start either with the ring or the pill after six months, 
they switch over and at that period they choose the ring or the pill or no product. And what was seen uh, from this study is that there was very high adherence for both the ring and oral prep. But what was different in this study is that uh, the adherence support was offered as a menu of adherence support. So they, they would choose whether they want SMSs, whether they want um, WhatsApp messages, whether they want support groups. Um, that there were many other methods that were offered as a way of support. And then they would choose a menu of what works best for them. And uh, so this was among the first studies to demonstrate that even among young women, young adolescent girls and young women could use these methods and that they are also safe. So it could be an option for HIV prevention and that adherence can be achieved with, with tailored support. Now, this is uh, now changing gears again. Is now something new that's also coming and you're going to hear about some of this research that's going to happen in Kenya is use of antibodies. And this is direct transfer of antibodies and it is both being used for treatment and prevention and um, there are many studies that are happening, and this is either being done IV or subcutaneous, where one gets antibodies for about two months to see whether those would protect them from getting HIV. Remember, anytime you get an infection, you get antibodies. When you get a vaccine, your body produces antibodies. But this, these antibodies specifically are now coming in as prepared antibodies, which you get. So these are already ready, so you almost jump a step of enabling your body to produce antibodies. And these are also going to be tested. Uh, I know I've not mentioned about vaccine, but there's a lot happening around the vaccine. Some of the vaccines have been have sh uh, promising, showing an efficacy of about 30%, but there's still a lot of work. There's also something else I want to mention, which is also not very new, but research demonstrated this about 10 years ago, but the uptake has, or the information has not gone on many people are still not aware or still doubt, doubt it, which is known as treatment as prevention. The, what research showed is that when people who are HIV infected use ALT, ALT continuously on, or consistently, they are able to achieve viral suppression. And once a HIV infected person achieved virus, achieves viral suppression, then there is no risk of HIV transmission. And that's why I was saying Aria, that for serial discord and people in serial discord relationships, if the one who is HIV inf infected is adhering, then you do not need the HIV uninfected person to take PrEP as long as they have achieved viral suppression. Actually, there hasn't been any HIV transmission that has been shown to occur when somebody is virally suppressed. And this trial, this is a node trial, it's a landmark trial known as HPTN052 that was able to show that uh, there, there was no HIV transmission for people who are virally suppressed. And because even the number of infections that were able to be shown, there wasn't any linked transmission based on, on that. So in summary, we, when you think of HIV transmission or HIV prevention, we would want the HIV prevention toolbox to look like what we have for pregnancy prevention, where we have several methods. We have, there, there are, there are, we have pills, we have condoms, we have injectables, and we have all these methods. And sometimes the use is not too consistent, but still works. So, and, but people have choices. For those of you who have done family planning or contraceptive studies, you are able to see that you have injectable contraceptives that are very popular for various reasons. You have oral contraceptives, you have implants, etc. And so when you think about prevention is you have a toolbox. And this toolbox is becoming bigger and larger with time. These are some of the tools that are currently in the prevention toolbox, but we have many others that are in the pipeline. I know I did not talk about injectable HIV prevention. And there's a drug currently known as cabotegravir 
that has demonstrated safety and efficacy and has even been found to be superior to oral PrEP because of uh, adherence. And this injectable is given every two months and soon it's going to move to the next stages because research takes time. So it's been shown to be effective in clinical trials. But you know, injections are not as easy as um, oral pills. When it have to be, if it's being rolled out, you need to know who is going to be giving injections, when, how. There are also a few other things that are being discussed regarding the pharmacokinetics of the drug in terms of when you stop, you still have some drug remaining in you after the injection. And if you're not getting a new injection, and there, there are discussions around how that will be handled. Because if you have suboptimal levels of drug, then you can end up acquiring HIV, which would lead to resistance. So there, there are some talks around that. There are also talks around having implants, again, for HIV infection, to prevent HIV acquisition. Again, those are also, there's research doing very well there. And for implants, you are thinking about a near implant, like similar to what you get for contraception, where you can even get a five-year implant. There is an annual implant for HIV prevention, and that drug is known as Isra, Isra Travel, and that's also going to work very well to prevent the risk of um, HIV acquisition. Another thing that is also happening very soon also is, um, and that research is going to be done in Kisumu, is about a long-acting pill where you get, you take a pill a month, and then that protects you from HIV. So all this is research that's happening. It's happening in Kenya, happening worldwide. So there is a lot, but uh, just to remember that all pre-exposure prophylaxis that is currently being scaled up in Kenya is only first generation. All these other methods are around the corner. We also know that populations that are at high risk of HIV acquisition, especially young women, are also at risk of unwanted pregnancies. So there is um, there are some multi-purpose technologies that are also being piloted or in clinical trials and have also been shown to be safe. Before now, they move on to the other steps. And uh, these multi-purpose technologies are, for example, a ring that can be used to prevent both uh, HIV and their pregnancy. And so there is a um, need to keep thinking around. And what's also in interesting is that as the prevention field moves that way, the treatment field is also moving in the same direction. So soon for prevention, rather than the way people go for ALTs and keep taking a pill every day, is that now they're going to have, there's also going to be injections, implants, pills, and others that are longer acting. So the field is looking quite interesting. So I think most of the work I've presented has been done by many, many people, both locally and internationally. And uh, in Kenya, we have about 100,000 people who have started PrEP and um, many other people who would like to thank. So thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Prof. I think that is really a huge package of information. Um, that you've really unleashed on us. Uh, some of us are not really experts in that area. We are consumers of information in that area. So really, this is a lot of information. And I think we are, we are more informed. We are better now on how to really take care of ourselves and how to do pre, I mean, uh, HIV prevention, even on our day-to-day -day lives. So I think... Uh, there are several, our time has really gone, but uh, really we cannot complain because really that was a very, very positive discussion. But we're going to take a few questions uh, that have been posted uh, by members who are listening online. Uh, I'm also going to check if there are any questions on YouTube. And I'm also going to post them over to you. And this, let's then open this up for discussion. So members, uh, there's a question about discordant couples, HIV discordant couples in Kenya. Uh, what are the rates and how are we faring globally and what would be the reasons for that? Are we, are we within the range, the, the normal? Are we on the high side or are we on the low side? And why are we faring like that? Maybe if we could start okay. off. Yes. yes. So uh, uh, as I said earlier, is for any HIV transmission to occur, there is usually a serial discordant relationship. 
One has to be negative, the other one has to be positive for HIV transmission to occur. So this number of couples is, 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 not, is within what would be expected and it, it keeps evolving. So if you had 200,000 couples last year, you might have another 200, but it's not necessarily all the same couples. Some of them would now have become what you call concordant positive. Yeah? And I remember when you were doing some of this work, some couples would come and uh, you'd talk to them and they would say, you know, we've not been using any protection and we are discordant, it means that I'm immune, so we'll continue as we were. Only to come back after a few months or, or a few weeks and test them and find the one who thought they would not get HIV, who thought they were immune, that they're already positive. So there are is, this is something that keeps evolving. So I would say that um, it's important to know that um, this happens. The couples are there in all the countries, but wherever you have higher incidence, the higher the number of discordant couples. So like in sub-Saharan in sub -Saharan Africa, the South African countries have a higher HIV incidence and prevalence than probably countries in East Africa. So you would expect higher numbers of HIV serial discordant couples. And the benefit of appreciating about serial discordant couples is that many people assume that their partner status is their own status. So if one has a wife, the wife goes for, for ANC, for example, they are tested, they are told they are negative, they come and tell the husband, I'm negative, the husband is happy and says we are HIV negative. Yeah, and, and that ends there. But uh, research has shown that not, that's not the, the case. So there's, it's very, very important for people to be tested as a couple. So even when people who are pregnant and get tested, they need to tell their husbands to come to the clinic and get tested. And now testing is becoming easier. So you could even have um, a HIV self-test kit. They could buy a HIV self-test kit and test themselves at home in the presence of each other. That's good information. We don't assume that we are both negative. Everybody must be tested on their own. Yes, yes. Okay, Th thank you very much. Uh, there's a question by Elizabeth. Will, uh, will uh, PR, will PrEP work as effectively if the HIV positive partner is virally unsuppressed? Like if the high viral load are above a thousand copies by mail of blood. Will they still work? Even, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it will work. Actually, it's for the, when the, the partner is not very suppressed. Prep is when the partner is for when the partner is not very suppressed. But if the partner is very suppressed, you don't need prep. Okay. Irrespective and, and, of the viral load, even if the viral load is how high, because uh, uh, we have seen in research, and I talked even about animal models that would be challenged with very high levels of uh, virus. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so does the HIV partner need viral load monitoring where the partner is on PrEP and how frequent and the feasibility of the same given the challenges of viral load testing in our country? I agree completely. In fact, now what the, the current science and the current discussion globally is around having point of care viral load results. Because mm -hmm. when somebody has, has viral load results that they can be able to get in a clinic, they walk in and they get that viral load results, they're going to be very reassuring. But overall, if somebody is adhering to drug, it's not defaulting, they will achieve viral suppression. So sometimes you may not need to consistently every six months have a viral load done if um, somebody is adhering well. But for reassurance and mental, somebody to feel comfortable, there is need to sort of have that viral load result. And uh, it is important to have point of care viral load uh, tests. And probably I would even call a bond scientist in Jamokinata to also do research to develop some of these point of care tests. So probably Prof, with regard to that, probably you need to post your, your email address on the chat for people to be those who may want to pick up discussions with you on this yes. area. And probably those who would probably want to also be part of your, your research team, etc. Okay. Even as we continue. So, so does PrEP have an effect on the drug resistance? Say if one does acquire HIV in the future. And if so, does the benefits outweigh the risks? This is a question from Mariam Zibo. That's a, a great question. And I can say we have been uh, with that question has been asked a lot. 
two items. One, if somebody is adhering well, they will not acquire HIV. So, and these drugs are very short half-lives. The oral, oral drugs are very short half-lives. So for, when somebody is at risk, they should take PrEP and adhere. So if you adhere, then you don't get HIV. So you, there's no risk of resistance. Two, if, and then if you stop, if you are season of, of risk, remember, HIV risk is not a life for a lifetime. It's a season. So probably before somebody is married or before they have had their partner tested or before, you know, all those, those are seasons of risk. And then if they stop taking PrEP because, for example, their season is over, then the, um, the drug wears out very fast. And so there will not be a risk of resistance. The one that has a, a theoretical risk of resistance is the injectable. Because the injectable and the implants are not, do not have, the drugs do not have a very short half life. So you, they, you, you still have your, a drug in you for, for some time. And that's where the risk is. And that's why there is some discussion. And that's what they are, and the scientists, for those who have done pharmacology, that's what you call a, a PK tail. Yeah. And this PK tail could run into months, and that would be the problem. And when somebody stops having an injection, there, there are discussions around having some being put on oros for some time so that then the person is still protected. So, but if for any case there is resistance that has been detect, detected, we have been able to see that this resistance was very fast. But even if it doesn't, then they, you can always use a different regimen of ALVs. And there's currently resistance testing happening in Kenya for people who acquire HIV when they're on PrEP. And then they will become on what regimen to go with. Okay. But that's a good question for discussion. There is a lot of discussion. But even if, as I said, you got a few people getting resistant, you have prevented thousands of infections because of people being on ALT, on PrEP, who could have ended up on ALT. Okay. Thank you. And, and again, Miriam is asking, saying um, HIV evolves to escape the action of neutralizing antibodies produced by the body, leading to increased diversity. How are these synthetic antibodies acting differently to avoid further evolution, hence drug resistance? Oh, so, so on the question of antibodies, yeah? so the antibodies are, are, are synthetic. It's not, uh, I mean, you know, these, these are, are modified antibodies. And so, so they have been, they're still very early in research, but generally is that they, they, are, they are thought that they are going to, to be able to, to, to work well, but uh, it's still a question of in research. So we, we may not be able to answer specifically how they are going to escape the, or how they are going to sort of protect people from the virus as it, as it evolves. But uh, probably in a year or two years when we have run these trials, we'll be able to say, but, Currently in Kenya, we should have these studies beginning the next two or three months. Prof, you keep talking of studies in Kenya. Why is Kenya taking lead in a lot of these studies? Even uh, when you showed us the map of uh, prep use or take rollout in Kenya, Kenya is actually among the the leading globally. What is <laughs> why Kenya? Well, what's what is, what is happening? That's a good question. So first of all, I would say is that uh, Kenya has the fourth highest burden of HIV in the world. That's one. Two is that uh, is that uh, Kenya is, it may look very high. We're having a, good, a lot of good research, but actually there are countries that read on research, like South Africa in the in the African continent. Nevertheless, credit where it's due is that we have very good scientists, both from our universities and from our research institutions like Cambridge. Globally respected scientists who are at any one time, I talk giving big talks in um, in big conferences in the world. Yeah. So that, that also helps when you have scientists who are doing well, who are doing good research. In West Africa, for example, there has been very big challenges in, around conduct of research. And that's why I always tell people, it's good to do good research because what happened in some of the West African countries, there were issues in terms of doing research as it's supposed to be. We, we, we talk about GCP, good clinical practice. And the, the, the science there, the, the, how the clinical trials were, were being done, there were some challenges in how the science was being implemented. And some of those countries actually have very, very few clinical trials. Yeah? And it only happens if two or three 
scientists do research in a way that's not supposed to be done, where probably you are not following, adhering to the research protocols, then that becomes a huge, huge problem. Because not only does the scientist get, get blacklisted, but even sometimes institutions or countries can get blacklisted for, for cutting edge research. That's very important for us because uh, members, just for your noting is that next week we'll be having a discussion uh, on research funding. We have an expert uh, on uh, research granting and funding talking uh, delivering a webinar next week on Wednesday, we'll be sending out that invitation in the course of the week. So please feel free to join us and uh, let's have a discussion on uh, uh, acquisition of research funding and ethical research, I mean, conducting ethical research, so that we don't fall into the problems Professor is actually alluding to. Um, Waweru Mwangi is having an interesting question here. And he's saying that mobile phones, modern mobile phones are now being used to take in body measurements such as temperature, pressure, and perspiration, etc. Is it possible to use this as a solution in things like monitoring of HIV as well? Uh, yes, although I'm not too sure how the, the, the technology has not reached there yet to, for example, do viral load and other things, uh, and probably even testing. So I think um, the the, that is something that I would encourage that kind of research to be done mm -hmm. so that uh, we can have tools that uh, can use mobile phones and, and things like those to, to, to monitor HIV or even test for HIV. So it's, I would personally encourage those kind of things. Great. So we probably will encourage Professor Aero Mondi, who is an expert in artificial intelligence, to get in touch with your team to see how you could work together to see because I know you can test blood pressure using your mobile phone now so uh, these are interesting days I must say yes, yes indeed and we actually need those as I think viral road monitoring is one of the biggest challenges yeah so if we could be able to get a tool that could be able to use artificial intelligence for viral road monitoring that would be a game changer excellent excellent uh, there is a question on vaccine from uh, Willis Owino, Professor Willis Owino. Why is it possible to produce COVID-19 vaccine at a comparatively shorter time span as compared to HIV? It's now been decades since HIV uh, broke out and we still don't have a vaccine. Or rather, we are still in very early stages, as you mentioned, I think they're in what you called injectables probably. Yeah, so why, why is that the case? <laughs> that, that's a very good question. And that, the, the last week there was a big meeting in Germany. Though I missed that session on, on, on the vaccinology because I, as we say in HIV prevention, everybody else has their, like their discipline where they focus on, so I focus on drugs specifically. But I want to say one is that the, the vaccine, HIV vaccine technology has actually helped uh, the COVID vaccine development because they have actually, some of them have actually used some of those platforms that were initially developed for HIV. Two, I want to mention that these are two different viruses that behave differently. Yeah? But generally, there is some kind of very nice kind of relationship between these two where you're using one platform to develop a vaccine for the other. But there's a lot of uh, good discussions and probably if Professor Wino could email me, I could email some of those kind of discussions that are happening. Yeah, and we are also discussing with, with other colleagues. But uh, there is there is something there. There is a, there are two different viruses, so you it would behave different. So are we saying the COVID vaccine virus is is, is an easier one to handle than the, <laughs> the HIV one? To develop a vaccine, oh, yes, yes. Oh, it is. Ah, okay. Yeah. But the, but the, many of those also used platforms that were initially developed for HIV vaccine. So if, if there, was no, uh, there wasn't science on HIV vaccines, and if HIV was not existent, probably COVID vaccines would not have taken such a short time. Okay, okay. Wow, um, um, and uh, well, in nutrition, you know, we, we encourage what we call um, exclusive breastfeeding of, of children from birth up to about two years. And then now, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned about uh, use of PrEP in breastfeeding. 
And uh, you mentioned that the small amounts, very small amounts that get into the breast milk and onto the child. So are there risks, probably long-term risks, now with, with breastfeeding for at least the past two years of life? What risks are we looking at probably in the long term, maybe not in the short term, or probably even short term? Are there studies that are looking into this or that have already looked into this? Uh, no, no, we only did this uh, pharmacokinetic study that was looking at the amount of drug in the breast milk. But all I can see is a very small amount. It was 0 0.00234. That's a very small amount. Remembering that these drugs are also being used in, on infants where we are getting 30 milligrams, getting to a baby per day. So that's a very, and we've still, even those high doses, we've not seen a longer term effect. Though our study was only for a short time, so we, we may not be able to talk about longer term effect, but those are, I, I doubt that there will be a problem. But also look, as I said, everything has a risk, but then you compare risk versus benefit. So for a woman who is breastfeeding, and using PrEP means she is at risk of HIV acquisition. So if she doesn't use PrEP, she acquires HIV. There is very high risk of HIV transmission when somebody acquires HIV during that period. Because then when you acquire HIV, soon after acquiring HIV, viral will shoot. So there's a very high risk of mother to child transmission even during breast milk. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's better to use um, protection than acquire HIV where the risk of HIV transmission to the baby would be would be much, much higher, many, many times higher than the, the small risk that you'd have with the, with the micro amount of drug going to the baby. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. I think, I think uh, we, we have gone past beyond our time. So we really would not want to, to really take a lot of time for very busy researchers and participants, but really properly, we really appreciate uh, your time, uh, your busy schedule, and uh, you know, we are really very happy that you are spearheading together with your team and others this research in Kenya and globally. And uh, I think uh, unless there is a burning question, we would like to stop here, but uh, Maybe any final words, Prof, before we invite uh, DVC research to say a word or two? Uh, no, man, it's just to thank the audience for listening. I think it's, uh, these are, there's a lot of science that's happening around the HIV prevention, and I would encourage people to read more. What I've given is just a, a, a tip of the iceberg. It's like the icing. There is a lot of work that has happened over the last 15 years. So I would encourage colleagues to just read yeah. about it for those who have an interest. And thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. I'm sure probably in future when we call upon you to also probably speak on other developments in the same area, I know you'll be very kind to, 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 to on our request and join us. And we are very happy. Uh, uh, Professor Maria Bukitsa Onyango, please give us CRP, maybe a few words as we conclude. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Research, uh, for organizing this uh, seminar, series of seminars. Thank you, our keynote uh, presenter today, Professor Kenneth Ngure, participants and guests invited to this or attending. For me, is to appreciate the activities that you are ongoing with these uh, uh, seminars. Secondly, I want to appreciate Professor Ngure. Professor Ngure, you should ask. Dr. Kinyuru, if you say there are, there are gifts of those who have highest others, I think you should think of rewarding those who have uh, a high uh, HI index. I think we some the food for thought uh, for Dr. Kinyuru because I think he has been in this for as a top author for some time. I am uh, aware of it. Uh, the other thing I want to appreciate Dr. Kinyuru is that most of the presentations we've had in the past were agricultural, I'm sure you are bring, I'm happy you're bringing public health and I want to see more, more coming in, in terms of manufacturing, ICT and uh, a build environment so that we can be able to have seminars on all the four big agenda of the government. And I see even today, the attendance is not bad, almost 30, over 30. And uh, I, I just salute you. I was listening keenly, though I haven't asked a question, but I've learned a lot. So, Professor Ngure, 
uh, work with us, with the, the division. I know you people in uh, public health and medicine, you kind of keep yourself aloof, but I encourage you to work with us. I believe this is a, a starting point. We can do more together so that we work as a unit. So I want to appreciate you and wish you well, and also congratulate you for the good work you are doing, and we don't take it for granted. You are making our university to be on the map. So keep the good work, and at some time, maybe we shall organize some training, Professor Kinyuru, for mentoring and training younger researchers, even out of the grants office, just how to do research and so on. So let's engage such uh, well-known internationally known researchers in other areas. So I thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good afternoon. And as uh, Dr. Kinyuru said, there's a next week uh, a seminar, which is important on fundraising. He has not disclosed who are these people who are coming, but we look forward to that presentation. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you very much, members. Uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Prof.